The story of Joseph in the pages of Genesis is actually an allegory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph became the greatest type of Christ to be found in the pages of the Old Testament. On our last program, we looked at his miracle birth and the meaning of his name. On today's program, we shall begin with his rejection. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me Joseph, the revealer of secrets. And what he reveals most of all is the life of Christ. And he does so thousands of years before Christ comes along. His life, which is not a fiction, it is a fact, historical, uh, is an actual historical a reckoning of real events just happens to detail about a hundred similarities between himself and the man who was to come as a redeemer, uh, Jesus Christ. Now, J.R., this is a testimony to the sovereignty of God. If we allow that this allegory uh, foretells uh, the life of Christ and his mission on earth, no human being alive back in the days of Joseph could have invented this story. Now, can you imagine what the odds might be? Ah of all of these similarities between Joseph and Christ, absolutely humanly impossible. Absolutely. Divinely ordained. He was asked by his father in chapter 37 of Genesis to go to Shechem to check up on the boys. He wanted to know how they were getting along and he sent some things for Joseph to take to them. Shechem means fellowship. Well, when Joseph got to Shechem, they had moved to Dothan which means law. Amazing, Gary, that these brothers, typical of Israel, mm -hmm. had moved from fellowship to law. And, and again, uh, this is always a, uh, a symbol in Scripture of moving away from God, moving away. And this is exactly what they uh, did. And again, this foreshadows something that was to happen to Israel uh -huh. later on. The dispensation of law. Yeah. Incredible. It is. <laughs> Now, Shechem was the place where the boys rejected Joseph. They threw him into a pit. And this pit, of course, is typical of a grave. Mm -hmm. uh, and in being thrown into this pit, he was then lifted out of the pit. Instead of dying, he escaped the death of the pit and was sold into Egyptian slavery instead. But typically, it pictures death. In fact, in later years, the bones of Joseph were brought back to the Holy Land and buried at none other place than, yes, you guessed it, Shechem, the place of fellowship. The same place he was thrown in the pit is the place where his bones were interred. So you can see that pit definitely referred to the <clears throat> grave. While he was in Egypt, he was mummified. At the Exodus, they carried his bones out. He was buried back at Shechem. You know, his, uh, his uh, burial in this pit uh, is symbolic of Christ's burial yes. later on, it reflects a, a number of interesting truths. For example, his brothers wanted to kill him. Mm -hmm. but, but Reuben interceded and said, no, 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 let's not kill him. Just, let's just toss him in this pit and leave him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they did so. And I think Reuben typifies that part of the house of, of David in the future that would uh, come to, to the aid of the Lord. And there were, was a divine remnant in the house of David that sided with Jesus and later on even became Hebrew Christians, you know. Mm -hmm. So here Reuben is kind of typical of that. Interesting too, they stripped him of his coat of many colors before they threw him in that pit. Yes, and we are told that Jesus was stripped of his clothes, that they were divided among the soldiers, and they cast lots upon his vesture, and uh, it was sprinkled with the blood that flowed from the uh, pierced side of Christ and from his hands mm -hmm. uh, that were pierced by the nails. And in like manner, um, Joseph's coat was dipped in blood and presented to the Father as the proof of sacrifice. Well, in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus returns, we are told that he will uh, be wearing a vesture dipped in blood. Mm -hmm. So here, the coat of many colors is typical of the vesture of Christ. The vesture of Christ, of the colors, I think, are representative of divine authority. And of course, later, uh, uh, later on, we're going to see all those colors woven into the fabric of the tabernacle. And then in the book of Revelation, we see all the rainbow colors around the throne of God. And here, this, this coat of many colors is typical of divinity. 
and even to the fact that it was dipped in blood, which is, of course, the uh, action of redemption. Yeah. One of the worst things that can happen to a person is to be rejected by its own, its own family. And they rejected him. Well, Just as our Savior, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. John's Gospel, chapter 1, tells us what a sad um, state of affairs. Well, and it was none other than Judah who sold Joseph for 20 shekels of silver, sold him for the price of a slave. And you know, Gary, in later years, it was a fellow named Judas. Yes, it was. Same name as Judah, who did this horrendous deed again for the second time and betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 shekels of silver. Incredible oh, typology. Even to the numbers, by the way. 20, you know, in the Jewish reckoning is the number of senses. Uh, that's the number of being counted. 30 is the number of maturity. So the 20 pieces of silver here that bought Joseph uh, reflected that which is to come. The 30 pieces which, which bought Christ, I think, represent that which is completed. Mm -hmm. uh, even the number of pieces of silver. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. And so he was cast into this pit, and then he was taken out of the pit and sold to Ishmaelites. Mm. Can you imagine? Ishmaelites had a hand in the um, selling of Joseph and taking him down into Egypt. These uh, uh, sons of Ishmael, the brother of Isaac, and uh, what a wicked deed they did in helping yeah. to reject. So, you see, Joseph was not only rejected by his brothers, he was also rejected by the Ishmaelites. And uh, to me, this typifies all who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Abraham's mistake uh, with Hagar comes back to haunt the tribes of Israel time and time again. And isn't it amazing how this drama is played out over and over again down through history? It's being played out today. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ishmaelite descendants are still troubling Israel even to this very day. Incredible. So he was taken into Egypt. He escaped the pit of death and was sold into Egypt. Well, in like manner, if you'll check with the life of Christ, you will find out that he too escaped death by being taken into Egypt. Uh -huh. And I think this is rather remarkable, Gary, because um, uh, we are told that Jesus as a babe was sent into Egypt that Hosea's prophecy might be fulfilled, which says in Hosea 11:1, 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Uh -huh. So Joseph went down into Egypt as a type of the future uh, trip of Christ into Egypt. And I think it's worth uh, restating once again, as we have uh, very often, that Egypt in Scripture is a type of the world or the world system. And so Joseph's trip into the world, that is the world system, Egypt, the evil, uh, yeah. uh, scheming world system, represents uh, the actions of Jesus after he was resurrected, then his followers went out into the, the entire world, Jew and Gentile. The Jews into diaspora, the Gentiles spread the church all over the world, throughout the world system, awaiting final redemption. Yes, just as Joseph finally was redeemed and was made the governor over all of Egypt, Christ will be exalted to rule over all the world. So Egypt is a type of the world kingdom over which Christ will reign. It's a prophecy. <laughs> Now, when he went down into Egypt, Joseph became a servant. He was sold to um, Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. And um, Joseph found grace in Potiphar's sight. Joseph became the overseer of his house. And in other words, he was, he was the man that took care of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, as that, he became a servant. Even so, the Lord Jesus Christ took upon Himself the form of a servant. Philippians 2, 6 through 10 says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation, and took upon Him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. But it says, God has also highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Wow. What a tremendous story Joseph here is of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every little detail 
depicts Christ, doesn't it? I think we see a little hint of the gospel of grace because in the in Genesis 39, 4, it says, Joseph found grace in his sight, that is, Potiphar's sight. He found grace in the eyes of this Gentile. That is, the Gentile looked upon him and saw something wonderful yeah. in his character and in his integ integrity. Uh, to me, almost symbolic of, uh, uh, of today's Gentiles seeing grace when they look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And so, Joseph, uh, whose years as a servant was not to last forever, but he was finally exalted to rulership, Christ's kingdom is coming. He's going to be ruler over that kingdom, and his kingdom will last forever. Joseph had it pretty good in Potiphar's house until Potiphar's wife got her eyes for um, Joseph and tried to seduce him. And the scorned woman lied and had Joseph thrown into prison. There he was numbered with the transgressors, another type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah tells us, Gary, that Jesus also was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12, and of course Isaiah is that, 53 is that great messianic chapter. Uh, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Mm -hmm. We can't pass this up because to me this is the key to redemption. Sure, we speak of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his ascension, and so forth, but if he had not actually taken sin upon him, the redemption could not have been completed. And so Joseph has to act out that part of the, of the story as well. And, and it's a horrible thing to see this man of character dragged down into the mire and as a result of Potiphar's wife's actions, falsely accused, tossed into prison. Mm -hmm. Jesus, too, was accused by lies. Mm, he certainly was, the greatest kangaroo court in history. Yes. Now, in the prison, Joseph meets a butler and a baker. He, the, he becomes the savior of one and the judge of the other. The savior of the butler, the judge of the baker. Two thieves, shall we say. Well, Christ was nailed to the cross between two thieves as well. Mm. So they, I think, typify the scene at Calvary. One of those thieves cried to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, okay. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I can see this as the butler. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The butler was restored to the kingdom. <clears throat> he was. The baker was executed. That's true. And I think this is typical of the other thief. And you know, here is Joseph thrown into this Egyptian prison with the butler and the baker. Uh, the butler's job was to bear the cup that is attend to the personal needs of Pharaoh, mm -hmm. a man very close to Pharaoh himself. And Joseph, uh, they, they asked Joseph to interpret their dreams. He said, I will. Uh, show me kindness after I've done this for you. When you get out of prison, uh, think kindly upon me. Maybe you can do me a favor someday. And he uh, told the chief butler that, that his dream uh, would put him back within three days in the court of Pharaoh. And JR, the dream involves Pharaoh's cup. Yes. Squeezing grapes into a cup. The cup is mentioned four times in the butler's dream. Yeah. Four is the number of the kingdom. The grapes and squeezing the juice of that grape is a very much a figure yes. uh, of uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The blood of Christ, right. blood of Christ. And we yes. have here, I think, a, the cup of destiny. Yeah. This is the kingdom in, in the hands of Messiah. Uh, in, in that great future day. Mm -hmm. And it leads on further to the time when Joseph's cup is put into the mm -hmm. uh, sack of grain. Yeah. And uh, we, are, we are told that Jesus held up the cup the night before his death and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, the New Testament. Oh, yeah. And uh, then, of course, at, uh, at uh, Gethsemane, Jesus said, let this cup pass from mm -hmm. me. So we can see the symbolism of the cup. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's, it's royal impression mm -hmm. down through history. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that after uh, the uh, butler was restored to his position as the cup bearer to the Pharaoh, mm -hmm. two years went by before he remembered Joseph. Mm -hmm. I think that's typical of 2,000 years, two millennial days. In other words, there was a weight involved. Yes. 
And Joseph waited in prison, by the way. And so, uh, one of these days, Jesus is going to be remembered. And a good word will be put in for him. <laughs> and he will become uh, the one who takes care of Israel and saves them through the seven years of famine, called by the other prophets the tribulation period. And so, there comes the time now when Pharaoh has a dream. He dreams uh, strange dreams. He brings his uh, ma court magicians before him, and they cannot determine what the dreams mean. And that's when the butler then remembers Joseph, and he tells the Pharaoh that Joseph can interpret dreams, and Joseph is brought. Brought to interpret the dreams. Well, uh, the, these are dreams of cows and corn. And we've all heard the story about the, uh, the, the, uh, the fat cows and the lean cows uh -huh. and uh, the Pharaoh trying to wrestle with this. And at this point, the but butler remembers, you know, there's a guy down in prison that I, uh, I believe could interpret this dream and he was brought up. This is the cup bearer and I believe it's the cup coming back into play again. This is the uh, Joseph's, if you will, cup of destiny that brings him into the court of Pharaoh. Uh -huh. Now, once Joseph interprets this dream, he tells the Pharaoh that there are going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, and that, that the Pharaoh could prepare uh, for the seven years of famine by saving back a percentage of the grain to prepare uh, for that time when they could feed the people. And you know, Gary, it's interesting to me that the people were able to, uh, to get by on a percentage of the grain. It wasn't an easy time, but they were able at least to fend off the seven years of famine, because it must have been a terrible famine worldwide uh -huh. uh, when that, those years of famine came. That's the tribulation period, isn't it? Typical of the tribulation it period. It really is typical of the tribulation period, and not only that, sort of an attitude about the tribulation period. That is to say, uh, it shouldn't be approached lightly. One should prepare or be, be prepared. Now, this, we're talking here about the descendants of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We're talking about Israel. One of these days, Israel's going to have to be prepared to go through seven lean years. And uh, it's just an astounding uh, prophecy here of the tribulation. Uh, do you suppose those seven years of uh, plenty mm -hmm. could precede the seven years of tribulation? Mm. The world uh, being, uh, shall we say, prepared for a world government mm -hmm. and a one world monetary system with prosperity? Absolutely. You know, J.R., uh, just a side note, if you look at the world today, uh, there are uh, pockets of famine and difficulty, as there always have been. But in general, the world economy is burgeoning. We find even the Chinese economy is, is growing like a mushroom. Uh, the, the, uh, the Japanese, the Malaysian economy, the global economy is growing very rapidly. I these think of NAFTA be, and GATT, don't you? NAFTA and GATT, <laughs> sure. We have fat years right now. Yeah, these are fat years. Mm -hmm. Our stock market has reached new highs. Yes. And even though it's uh, had a correction of sorts, it's not uh, severe. And uh, so I think uh, we may be in the seven years of uh, plenty prior to the seven years of famine. Could well be. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we are. It just means that it looks like a good possibility. We're not trying to be date setters here. But I'll tell you, these seven years of plenty in Egypt in the life of Joseph are typical or prophetic of the seven years prior to the tribulation period and then the lean years that of the tribulation itself. Mm -hmm. When the whole world is going to be brought to its knees in the, with the judgment of God. And I see that going on right here. Now Joseph is exalted by Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, he's made governor over the entire land. Now, I, as I uh, read this, it looks as though he reports directly to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. You can't ask for a more favored position. Uh, he is, something about this man is so instantly uh, respected that he's recognized. Now, that's typical of what in the future when he becomes governor over all the when land? Christ becomes King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> Amazing, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Now, Joseph is given a Gentile bride. And on our next program, we're going to discuss this Gentile bride of Joseph because uh, that's my favorite subject. Oh, yes. 
You see, Christianity happens to be the Gentile bride of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see Christianity uh, in this age of grace uh, when Joseph takes his Gentile bride. So, it'll be an absolutely fascinating study. And then, of course, the brothers will come, and they will see him, but they will not know him. So it is with Israel today. They know about Jesus, but they think he's just one of those crazies, and we, they don't understand who we are and why we should love him. But one of these days they will understand.